Greetings from Manila and welcome to today's Asian Impact Webinar sponsored by the Asian Development Bank. Uh, my name is Albert Park. I'm the Chief Economist and Director General of ADB's Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. And I'll be the host of today's webinar on building resilience with social protection in time of crisis. ADB has been promoting impact evaluation studies in order to improve the development effectiveness of project and policy interventions. Uh, we have supported more than 20 impact evaluation studies in recent years, as well as pilot interventions to increase awareness about the importance of impact evaluation and to provide impact evaluation training to government official, officials. Uh, today's study is one of the studies that we have supported led by colleagues from our social development thematic group. Uh, for this session, we will first start with a scene setting presentation and then a panel discussion. So let me, uh, without any further ado, uh, turn it over to Dr. Emily Beam who will give a 15 minute presentation on impact evaluation of the graduation of the ultra poor pilot in the Philippines. Emily is an assistant professor at the University of Vermont. She's a PhD product of the University of Michigan working with former colleagues of mine when I was a faculty there. Uh, she's also a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor, IZA. She works closely with Innovations for Poverty Action and is the expert researcher for this impact evaluation study. So Emily, the floor is yours. Thanks so much and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. What I wanna talk about and to get things started is just to share some background on this particular pilot study um, that we conducted um, as a partnership between Innovations for Poverty Action and also with close work from BRAC, the Department of Labor and Employment and also ADB. Essentially what we're thinking about and what, where we kind of came together was around this idea of building economic inclusion through multifaceted support. And so what I mean by that is the idea that poverty itself is complex, the causes of poverty are complex and there hasn't been and doesn't seem to be sort of one magical solution to help families lift themselves out of poverty. And so a lot of the work that Barack has pioneered and others have been working in, in as well is toward the idea of using multiple types of supports with ultra poor households who are facing these sorts of multiple interrelated challenges and that those together can help families um, increase their incomes, build resilience, diversify um, their livelihood sources, et cetera. And so the hallmark of these types of programs, which I am, probably too often going to call graduation programs, um, but we can also think of them as economic inclusion programs. And sometimes that's really closely related to this idea of social protection. They usually involve four main components, though you know there are many different types of variations. Usually the centerpiece here is thinking about providing some sort of productive asset. This can be through um, cash that's sort of labeled, please use this to buy some goats or to get a piggery started. It can also be through the provision of just plain cash, or it could also be the provision of sort of an in-kind transfer, um, whether that's providing pigs and, and feed and supplies to get started in a livelihood program. That also is aligned with training in how to manage and run the livelihood um, successfully. Now, in addition to that sort of centerpiece of an asset, um, people who are participating in these types of programs are usually receiving some sort of regular cash transfers, basically building regular consumption support to help household members meet their basic needs and reduce some of that immediate pressure so that they're able to think about long-term development um, and focus on building their livelihood. Another key component has been the provision of life coaching or skills training. Um, and this can take many forms, but usually um, traditionally has involved a coach coming and working one-on-one -on -one, um, on a semi-regular basis, maybe twice a month in terms of covering a range of topics ranging from um, building financial literacy, but also providing just support in managing the problems and challenges, not just related to their livelihood, but around their entire, um, around their entire lives. And then there also are often health and financial inclusion components as well. So 
I won't get into this because we could spend an hour talking about it, but there's a really large and continuing to grow body of evidence that highlights that these sorts of programs that are layering these multiple types of support um, have been quite successful and they've been quite cost effective, um, yielding, you know, much greater benefits in terms of consumption, just as one dimension, um, than the costs, um, particularly over time. But at the same time, one thing that has been sparking a lot of discussions, and I think is really important behind the motivation for this study, is that when we think about these programs, they also can be quite expensive. Um, and the cost can be quite variable as well. So some initial really hallmark studies found that the costs per participant over the lifespan of the program, which in this case was usually about two years, range from say $280 to almost $2,700, right? And that's a lot of money. Um, it's one thing when it's a pilot program, but as you start to think about scaling up to reach larger shares of the poor population of a, of a, of a country, you know, those, anything you can do to bring down costs or to bring down logistical costs in terms of making it easier to implement, that's going to allow policymakers to make programs either more intense, um, reach more people, or also just have resources to allocate towards other spending priorities. So with that, we came to the study with three research questions. The first was just to test this type of classic graduation model in the context of the Philippines, thinking about the impact of it when working with four-piece households, people receiving regular cash transfers already, but with the hope that multiple levels of support could help build resilience and lift families out of poverty. The second set of questions are really about within that model, what happens if we start tweaking a little bit? One is thinking about group livelihoods versus individual livelihoods. The idea here when I say a group livelihood is that traditionally one household receives one livelihood and then that household operates, receives training and operates that livelihood. But we might think in the case of something like a group livelihood, if people are working in groups of say three to five, which was what we were doing here, it might be the case that there are new livelihood and opportunities that are out there just if you're able to kind of pool resources. Um, one example that came up in this particular setting was that owning a carabao or water buffalo could be quite profitable because you can rent it out to help plow fields. But the value of the carabao is just, it's, it's too high to be able to actually implement it in terms of a individual livelihood. Just most program budgets don't afford that type of money. Apologies, I just jumped ahead. On the other side, hand, we might imagine that group livelihoods might be less effective if it's the case that there is more, there's more shirking people aren't um, are relying on other group members or something like that. And then the second element we're going to think of in terms of cost effectiveness and impact are through this lens of the coaching. So as I mentioned, one key component of these types of programs has been having a, a caseworker or a community facilitator or a coach come and work individually with households to help support them throughout this entire program. That, as you might imagine, is quite expensive. And one common discussion has been, is there a way we could bring those costs down? Um, but there's also questions around that about sort of the, the actual impact on the, the effectiveness of the program. If it's the case that the use of those types of groups can help people learn from each other, can help bring people together. In this case, people are gonna be coming together in a group of about 20 in their um, community and their barangay to discuss their problems and receive their coaching sessions, as you can see in this picture. If that builds more trust and cohesion, that could actually be an improvement. On the other hand, if we're losing that accountability, if we're losing that personal touch, that could weaken the program and undermine the goal of improving cost effectiveness. So with that background established, I want to talk a little bit about what we did in the pilot. Specifically, we worked with 29 barangays across five municipalities in Negros Occidental. And the, the key thing to remember here is that everybody in this sample, everybody who we're working with is already a member of the four Ps, and they're already receiving regular consumption support. They've also been added recently. So they were added to the program between 2015 and 2017, um, which was the most recent batch rolled into the program. Now, within that, at a geographic level, people were randomized into one of three arms or a control group. Now that said, the control group also still received that consumption support because that was the sample. The reason for doing this type of randomization is that we wanted to ensure that when we looked at the outcomes for members of each group, that any differences could be attributed to just the variation in the program. And the only reason that they were in those different groups was because of random assignments. We could feel very confident about that. So like I said, we have a group livelihoods and group coaching arm 
So that's pooling, working in groups of three to five, and also having your coaching section, sessions in a group of 20. There's a second treatment arm, T2, which is retaining the traditional individual livelihoods, but also pooling the coaching. And then T3 is where we have individual livelihoods and individual coaching, which we can think of this as basically being the um, sort of status quo kind of traditional graduation approach. Um, they also receive skills training, savings facilitation, and community mobilization. But those were all the same across all of those um, all of those groups. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the outcomes for members of each of these three groups. We're going to compare them to the control group that just received consumption support, and then we're also going to do some comparisons between each other to see about relative effectiveness of these variations of the program. To give you a sense of the data, this program was we collected our endline data to look at outcomes um, from September to December 2021. And what that meant is that we were looking at things two years after the delivery of the initial intervention um, and about one year after the conclusion of the coaching section of the program. So essentially, we think that households have had enough time to engage with their livelihood, start to build and grow it. And it's been a little bit of time after the end and conclusion of the program. Of course, we should also note that this is happening um, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and so all of the livelihoods were able to be delivered prior to it, um, but there were some interruptions to the program, um, and so that's going to be something that affects really everybody um, in terms of this, this context. It doesn't undermine anything in terms of our experimental results and our ability to draw conclusions. It's just something for us to keep in the back of our minds when we think about the challenges that households were facing because they were dealing with a lot of very unique challenges um, as a result of the past few years. One thing I want to highlight as well is that we, when we followed up with households, we were able to find 98% of them, and that we, the likelihood we found people was the same regardless of how they were assigned. That helps us feel pretty confident that we're not missing folks. Um, for example, if some households were doing very well in the program and they happen to relocate to Manila, um, we might be concerned that we're missing those outcomes if we can't find them again. And we don't have any evidence to suggest that might be a problem. So with that background, let's take a look at the results. So as you might expect, we see um, high rates of people attending livelihood trainings and then eventually managing a livelihood for those assigned to receive a livelihood. But if you're looking at this, you're gonna notice that these numbers are not quite 100%. There were some logistical challenges that um, I think are quite important when we're thinking about scaling up. One of them was just trying to get things out to people. There were some delays and, and we ended up losing um, some people who ended up leaving the program. And we could see that delays were highest for this group livelihood group coaching arm. And that's where we saw the highest rates of attrition. Now, when we're gonna discuss results, I'm gonna be looking at those who did and did not finish, really averaging across everybody. Um, but one thing we should keep in mind is that not everybody took up um, and actually ended up completing the program. And we're also gonna see at the very end, um, the rates of current livelihood management um, have fallen by about half. So half of livelihoods are still managing that, lively, that livelihood, exactly the one that they had, and about 50 are not. This could be because they've paused or it could be because they've moved on to other types of income generating activities. Now that said, with all of those caveats, um, when we're looking two years later after the transfer and um, one year later after the um, end of the coaching, we can see that households reported um, doing better than those who were in the control group across a range of dimensions. So just to orient you here, what you should be looking at is the, the dark green bar. That's the mean values of members of the control group. So for example, monthly consumption per capita was about 4,000 pesos um, or about 80 US dollars. And what you can see from the light green, blue and yellow bars is that the graduation program yielded higher monthly consumption per capita. And these confidence intervals indicate that these are statistically significantly different from the control group, meaning we feel pretty confident this is not as a result of chance. We can also see that in terms of the value of productive assets, on average, the control group reported about 10,000 pesos of productive assets. And we see big increases in this, up to 12,000, up to 15,000, depending on the program. And we, we should expect that, right? Part of the, the program was receiving these productive assets. And we might be concerned if there wasn't a change because households might have actually drawn them down to support the consumption. But we see consumption it remains elevated and people um, have higher asset values. We didn't see any impacts in monthly income. You can see the directions are about what, you know, they're, they're positive, but you can see that those confidence intervals, those bars there are really quite big. Um, and to us, this really reflected that measuring household income is, is 
is really quite challenging, particularly for households that have highly variable incomes um, from multiple sources. I'll dive into that a little bit, um, but essentially we just, we don't see any impacts there. The last thing I wanna highlight is um, subjective well-being and also food security. So for subjective well-being, we use two measures of, of self-reported mental health with the person we talk to. And I normalize this down to zero. So really what we can interpret this is a, a standard deviation increase relative to the control group. And you can see that across the board, people report higher subjective well-being. We can't say that it's any different than zero um, after accounting for uncertainty in our sampling for members of the first and the third groups. But for those who were receiving the individual livelihood paired with the group coaching, we do see a 0.13 standard deviation increase in terms of subjective well-being, which is a very technical way of saying that the people in that group did report sort of less lower levels of mental distress um, as a result of the program. And then for food security, we do that same sort of normalization. We use two different measures of food, um, food security. And after normalizing them so we can kind of draw information from both, we can see that food security increased by 0.2 to 0.28 standard deviations across all of the households. Now, the other thing that I want to highlight here is those questions about effectiveness of various treatment arms. And so this, for this, we want to compare sort of the, the light green to the blue and the light green to the yellow arms and also the blue to the yellow. The first thing that really stood out to us is that when we're comparing the group coaching versus the individual coaching, so comparing blue to yellow, you can see there are differences, but they're not large um, and they're, they're not statistically significant across most, um, almost all of our measures. It really looks like the provision of group coaching or individual coaching um, was, was pretty neutral in terms of impacts on, agri on an average. With the group livelihoods, we see slightly lower effects, but at the same time, one thing to keep in, keep in mind is that a, there was lower participation rate among that group. And so when we do our cost effectiveness, we'll take that into account. So we don't see that the group livelihoods are outperforming, but on the other hand, we can't reject that they actually did about the same. It could be the case that they did the same and that would be consistent with our results as well. We thought about these productive asset values. And when we looked at these, we broke them down into different types to sort of see where the growth is. You can see that there's major growth, particularly for the individual livelihoods in livestock value um, and also and well overall productive value and also, um, actually I should, sorry, I'm, my video is on top of my slides, um, for livestock value. And then for business asset value, we see that um, more across the board, more evenly across the different treatment arms. This largely reflects not necessarily the nature of the program, but just the nature of the livelihood that people chose. As I said, we didn't see any change in monthly income that we could say was statistically significant. And we also disaggregated that just to make sure we weren't missing something here. So we don't really see changes in paid work and that tends to be relatively consistent with evidence from other contexts. We don't see an increase in business profits. We do see revenue go up, but again, it's, it's quite noisy here. And then we see that social support, either through people's own communities, through remittances, or through other methods of um, social safety nets, we don't really see any changes there. We do see an increase in business ownership. Um, this is supporting what we saw in that earlier table, that by the time we followed up with people, the likelihood that someone in the household owns a business rose from 22% to between 25 to 31%. And the likelihood that they were operating a business in the past 30 days went up from 17 to between 21 and 23%. In terms of sales, we see sales go up and we also see expenses go up, but again, we, that turned into a general increase in profits. So just to recap all of this, um, we see that all of our program designs increase household well-being, and we see this across multiple dimensions. We see improved monthly per capita consumption, which is really the, our kind of go-to measure of household well-being um, because it's one that we're pretty confident we can measure reliably. Um, and it also correlates so strongly with household well-being. Um, we, see a de we see an increase in food security, we see an increase in the value of productive assets, and then for those folks receiving individual livelihoods and also group coaching, we saw an increase in subjective well-being. Um, we don't see any evidence of income change, but again, we just see a lot of, a lot of noise in that, and so that's something that we, we just have to kind of keep in mind as we look at those results. Now, this question then comes as we see these, these improvements and we can see that some are comparable and some are not. What, is, what are the impacts in terms of cost effectiveness? So two things I want to draw attention to. The first is on the right, it's these bar graphs, and these just show the cost per treated household, each household that actually receives the treatment, and then the cost per offered household. Um, essentially, this brings down the cost of that first arm because not as many people participated in it. 
What we can see is that when we think about treating households, the shift from individual to group coaching yields a 20% savings in the overall cost of the program, bringing it down from $863 per person to $679. That, when you start thinking about scaling it up, can have a major implication for the ability of the program to use those additional resources elsewhere. And also, as I said before, we don't see any change in impacts. Now you can see in terms of cost effectiveness between group livelihoods and individual livelihoods that the individual livelihoods are a little bit more cost effective, but the difference is really not um, very great. And that's only if it, we're looking at per treated household. The other thing we wanna think of is sort of what's our return on investment, right? Um, we want to bring down costs so that way we can use those resources as efficiently as possible, but we don't wanna do so at, this, at the expense of effectiveness. So what we worked out here was what we can think of as a return on investment. And so what we're doing is we're kind of working through a way of thinking about the benefits to recipients, just focusing on consumption. There's other measures, right? We're just thinking about household consumption and we're imagining, here's what we saw over that two year period, what if we continue to see effects? And there we have to make assumptions, right? We don't know what happens in the year or the two years that follows. If it's the case that we see that effects are constant, they just continue, that increase in consumption persists over time, or if it rises, it's kind of rising together with the control group as households might be doing better over time, we hope, then in that case, the cost of our program is quite massive. Um, we're seeing a thousand percent returns here. Um, the other possibility, um, and I should actually make clear, I realize this now, this is the impact of the first treatment, this is the second, and this is the third. So you, again, see lower return on investment for that third treatment arm because the costs are higher. If it's the case that some of this effect starts to kind of fade away, 20% of it is, is sort of lost each year, we still see really high returns on investment. And in fact, they remain positive so long we don't lose any more than 60% of the effect in a year. This is something that, again, we can't, we don't know which bin we're in without additional evidence. Um, and in fact, there actually is evidence to suggest that results, effects may even grow over time. So some recent work by Banerjee and co-authors um, in a different setting did find that it wasn't just that effects persisted, but actually the gains that people who had received this program actually grew as, as time passed. So in terms of what our takeaways are here, the first thing that is sort of our I think the clearest message is that when we think about those impacts between individual and group coaching, we see relatively similar impacts. And we see that the group coaching performs better on consumption and it's cheaper. Now, one thing that we also need to think about is that this is always assuming we're holding everything else equal. We did see here that there were differences in the livelihoods that were selection, selected between the group and the individual. And so we actually are kind of looking at two things at once. One thing that's helped us feel a little better has actually been to turn to other evidence. And so one study that I've been, I've been giving quite a bit of thought to is a recent study out of Uganda in which they implemented a similar type of group versus individual coaching dimension. Um, and what's interesting is that even though it's a different context, working with refugees and host communities in Uganda, um, the actual, this entire result is actually about exactly the same. The group and the individual coaching arms were virtually indistinguishable. So that also helps us give, get confidence that, you know, again, does this mean in every setting it would be exactly the same? Probably not, but it's two pieces of evidence that suggest that when we switch to group coaching, we might yield cost savings without undermining the effectiveness of the program. We also see that the individual livelihood arms are generally performing group arms, um, outperforming them. But here we have to be a little bit more careful because on the one hand, this difference reflects the design of the program, but we also saw a slower implementation for that group treatment arm and as a result, higher attrition. Now, that said, that is still the nature of the program, right? Implementing this type of program, which is very complex, can be difficult and sometimes slow to implement. And so it doesn't make these results any less real, just a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging to think about. And so it's something to, to keep in mind there. Um, and then the other conclusion that we really had here was that if we want to see how these effects persist, if we wanna be able to say something a bit more specific in terms of which of these worlds are we in, that's where longer term follow-up would really be important, both to look at on average, how are these effects looking? Um, but we also might think about you know, what are the distributional impacts for households that were poorer versus wealthier within our pool, who were more successful and who were not, and how did that persist out? These are questions that we would need additional data to answer and could also be quite interesting as we think about, you know, what would it look like for a program similar to this in, you know, say another setting or a scaled up setting. So I will stop here, um, but I'm really looking forward to our discussion. So thank you.
Okay, thank you, Emily. That was a great, uh, excellent presentation. My name is Wendy Walker, and I'm the chief of the social development thematic group here at Asian Development Bank, and I'm going to be the moderator for the session today. Um, as we just heard from Emily, we're very pleased to share the impact evaluation results from the two-year implementation of the Social Protection for Economic Inclusion Project in the Philippines, also known as the graduation approach. Um, before proceeding, though, let me remind the audience um, to please type your questions in the Q&A box on the right-hand side or at the bottom of your screen um, so that we can be sure to address some of the areas of greatest interest. Please do give the thumbs up um, or like any existing questions, and we'll also address the most popular ones first. I see one is already over there, um, so hope that more come in in the next, in the next uh, minutes for the, for the session. Um, now I'd like to introduce three distinguished panelists that we have with us today. The first is Lauren Whitehead. Uh, Lauren is currently the Chief Technical Specialist for the UN Women Generation Equality Action Coalition and previously served for six years at BRAC as the Director of Technical Assistance for the Ultra Poor Graduation Initiative. Lauren was the team leader for the Philippines graduation approach that we just heard about and has extensive experience in the intersection of social protection and economic inclusion, women's empowerment and gender, and measurement and evaluation. A second is Aniceto Orbeta. Uh, Dr. Orbeta is the new president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. He's an economist interested in applied economic modeling, impact evaluation, education and labor market, social protection, demographic and economics, and information and communication technologies. He has very extensive experience in designing, conducting, and teaching impact evaluation of programs and policies. And finally, I'm happy to reintroduce our colleague, Albert Park. Albert, as he said, is the Chief Economist and Director of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation uh, Department here at ADB. And he's also the Chair of the Impact Evaluation Committee um, in, our, in our institution. So with those brief introductions and excellent panel, um, let's start our discussion. And I will kick off with a few um, questions here, but I see um, people in the audience are, are quickly catching up. So I'll be switching back and forth. Um, let me first turn to Lauren and ask you, um, Lauren, this project in the Philippines made an important variation in traditional approaches to implementing graduation programs by testing both group livelihoods and group coaching and individual livelihoods and individual uh, coaching. As the former team leader for implementing the project, what are your views on key elements required for scaling up economic inclusion programs like the graduation approach? And what lessons did you factor in this pilot to the design of the ongoing or follow on graduation approach for the sustainable livelihood program, which is also in the Philippines. So over to you, uh, Lauren, and I ask the uh, discussants to please uh, try to keep your, 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 your comments uh, relatively brief so that we can, we can get through this range that are showing up on the right-hand side. Thanks, Lauren. Wonderful, thank you so much, Wendy, and, and sincere thanks as well to my colleague, Emily, for the presentation just now. Um, I will endeavor to be brief in my remarks and also happy to answer many of the questions that I see coming into the chat. Um, I think there are a few things that definitely are worth reflecting on coming out of this pilot, and especially as we are already deeply into the implementation of um, DSWD's execution of the graduation program as well. Um, and so, a few things that I wanted to point out that may or may not come through when you're seeing some of the data. So I, I know that Emily mentioned as well that, of course, as we're all uh, very well aware of, the pandemic was a significant disrupting factor in the implementation of the pilot at the very start. Um, in a way, we almost wish that the pandemic had happened, say, two years after the pilot was already um, had been implemented, because in other contexts, we've seen that graduation has really helped to build resilience and these economic inclusion programs, especially when integrated with social protection, has helped to build resilience for households to shocks. And unfortunately, as this program was taking off, um, the pandemic began before even many households could actually receive their assets. Um, there were also some programmatic impediments that just came from the, the form and nature of how households received those livelihoods. So through the provision of physical assets, which is, is timely and uh, more costly, quite frankly, and, and a bit burdensome in terms of the actual implementation of the program. And so I think some of what we see 
coming through, um, even in some of the, the income impacts that we may not necessarily see versus some of the other consumptive patterns that we observed and, and some of the changes that Emily Way was able to point out. One thing that we also would want to look at in graduation programs is how resilience has been built in households um, and whether or not there are strong indicators that the resilience built in households shifted or changed in the nature um, between the individual livelihoods and group livelihoods as well as the individual and group coaching. So that's looking at things like the increased savings that households achieved, um, the overall financial health in terms of reduction in indebtedness, which was a, a high, um, was at a very high level at the outset of the program, um, reductions in, in risky borrowing as a result of that, and then asset diversification, which actually enabled many households in the examples that were shared to move into other livelihoods, even after the initial livelihood or business they may have received through the program um, had sunset for them as well. So I think those pieces are complementary to seeing the, the kind of impacts you would want to see in terms of income security. And I think, as Emily mentioned, the next few years, even coming back to this group, we'll be able to demonstrate whether or not those resilience factors were in place. And I mentioned those um, because when we think about scale up, that's actually something as well that we want to factor in. So recognizing what are some of the immediate gains we might see in terms of consumption, in terms of rising incomes and so forth, um, but even more particularly, what do we want to ensure that is the foundation and sort of the safety net that we're actually creating through such an approach for households? Um, so for example, within the uh, Dole pilot, uh, we definitely saw that there were significant factors around how the group coaching was actually carried out, um, not just the formality of whether or not it was individual or livelihoods, or, excuse me, individual or uh, group coaching, which was namely looking at whether or not households had active engagement and kind of interactive hands-on activities where they could really apply their learning very quickly, um, was also looking at specific sticky behavior change methodologies so that households would be able to not just listen to a lecture or kind of rote um, recitation of responsibilities and expectations, but then really be able to actually articulate those and turn them into action and behaviors that they could really activate fairly quickly. Um, there was also quite a bit of learning about what it meant to provide assets, as I mentioned. And as we moved into the work with the Department of Social Welfare and Development, there's actually been a shift to provide households cash instead of assets, so those assets can get in hand faster. There is some loss in the ability of households to be able to negotiate in the market when that we're not doing so in bulk and not supporting them in that same way and they're approaching marketing cash, but that seemed to outweigh the, um, the detriment and the impediments of actually providing physical assets, for example. There's also been quite a lot of work done in the um, DOLE, excuse me, in the DSWD pilot in terms of enhancing the livelihoods matching that is taken forth. And that is essential to think about in terms of scale, being able to avoid market saturation and ensuring that all of the households have livelihoods that are complementary to the market. But that also requires some market stimulation um, activities that would actually enable them to build out value chains, for example, which is something we didn't get to experiment with much with the group livelihoods here, but perhaps the group livelihoods may have actually been more effective if there was more market stimulation and establishing a value chain for those households to execute. I mean, I think the last thing I would mention is the digital monitoring as well that took place. That is a key factor that's been brought into the DSWD program as well. Um, um, the Padayan Sustainable Livelihoods Program, Padayan SLP. And that digital monitoring is also a key factor in being able to scale. So being able to actually track and monitor households um, routinely, quickly, and disseminate that information for sort of rapid program iteration, which you're able to do because of collecting through digital monitoring techniques. And it's also a lot less costly than um, doing paper-based monitoring and then de detailing the analysis of that uh, information as it comes in albeit on a much slower scale. So I would start there as just a few comments to think about as we're moving towards um, a pathway to scale. Okay, thank you. A few comments, but super comprehensive. Lauren, if I can just quickly get the clarification for you on the first uh, first uh, um, question in the question answer on, uh, um, uh, as far as I understand, graduation programs are usually designed for the ultra poor households. Are the 4P uh, beneficiaries uh, necessarily the ultra poor? Yes, um, so that's a very great question. And that was actually looked at as well with the household. So we looked across levels one, two, and three households um, within within uh, the 
within the Panther Wade Cash Transfer Program so that we were ensuring that we actually were reaching some of the, the poorest households with the intervention, the level one and level two households. There was a substantial mix of both with a primary focus on level two households as they were the largest number. Um, there were some level three households, but not very many. And I will say that the DSWD FDI and SLP has focused a little bit more on level two and three households that are seen to be on the cusp. Okay, thank you. Um, now for Dr. Orbeta, your organization, PID, serves as the Philippine government's primary socioeconomic policy think tank to help policymakers and planners in crafting their development agendas. Uh, from this study and based on other related impact evaluation studies that you've conducted, what are your views on the utilization of integrated approaches of cash and livelihoods with mentorship and coaching? And do you see scope for integrating such approaches into other government programs? Um, and if so, where would be most effective and what challenges? Thank you, over to you. Thank you for uh, inviting us and then uh, I, uh, the integrated approach strength is really incorrectly recognizing, as Similia has highlighted, that the poor faces multiple risks and deficiencies. This is a very sound framework, particularly for the ultra poor. The consistent uh, success of the integrated approach since the earlier studies uh, were with six countries that came out in science in 2015, and those that followed. Uh, is convincing explanation why, like microfinance programs, which are interventions uh, based on the main hypothesis that the, the main handicap of the poor is uh, lack of financing, has a checkered performance. It highlights a very uh, reality that the poor face several handicaps simultaneously, and that's, that has to be addressed simultaneously to move the poor out of poverty. And that's, that's uh, and the importance of uh, coaching has already been proven in, in, in before even the integrated approaches in works of like David McKenzie and colleagues on importance of mentorship and coaching in, in, in training and entrepreneurship studies. Uh, so uh, th that's uh, already, uh, th that's a uh, literature so that came out. So, it's, so that's why it's not uh, too difficult to, to uh, understand that uh, the poor are need uh, coaching to one, force first operate, then uh, 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 and uh, make uh, gr uh, grow their, their livelihood programs. It's, it's many of the poor are able to operate uh, livelihood projects on a sustain on a sustain, uh, subsistence basis, but uh, the capacity to grow sometimes is not there. That's why they, they, they stay in that 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 level of 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 of, of, uh, of performance. So this work, coaching and mentoring, can help. So to my mind, uh, except of course for the cost. Conceptually, there's no argument with the importance of uh, integrated approaches in, in especially uh, in general and particularly coaching and mentoring in particular for, for poverty programs. And in the Institute, we have done studies in microfinance programs and recently we have evaluated the Sustainable Livelihood Program of GSWD and we uh, added uh, uh, a modest, modest form of, of uh, coaching uh, to cash loans, uh, uh, essentially uh, revolving funds for Panta with beneficiaries. It's interesting to note that the study presented by Emil had similar results. Uh, for example, we didn't find impact on household income. Uh, of course, Emil found impact on expenditure, and savings, and capital investment. However, we also find positive effects on economic activity like labor for participation and work hours. Uh, uh, so, uh, for, uh, particularly for CCT spouses. It was found not to be cost effective uh, as the estimated benefits for four or five years uh, is smaller than the cost of delivering the project. And in addition, the purpose cost of delivering the benefits is higher than the private uh, microfinance programs and, and public micro, uh, microcredit and livelihood programs. So that's all. So uh, we also find problems uh, like uh, in group projects uh, uh, compared to individual parts. The theory says that group projects work if you have, you have equally motivated and committed participants to succeed. Uh, this is uh, not easy to achieve. Uh, uh, besides the group projects tended to have lack of direct individual or have delayed benefits which cause uh, loss of interest for participants. So as already mentioned, uh, in terms of scope, I, I think uh, if you're dealing with, uh, with, with uh, ultra poor, uh, this integrated program is, uh, I think, the only way to, 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 to move them out of poverty. Uh, one, as I have said, wants to implement the project themselves and make them grow, uh, which requires coaching. And, and, and that is what is needed. And the, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to know that uh, 
that's the SLP is adapting. Actually, what one of our recommendations in our study was for SLP to consider integrated approaches because they're, they have a very light uh, uh, coaching, uh, I call it nominal when it was when we would look at it. So that was the uh, that was one of the recommendations that we we provided. And talk to be more serious about the coaching part, uh, and and, uh, and and uh, and and I'm happy to know that uh, from from the presentation today. So until today, many programs are addressed. Uh, the, the basic program, many programs are address only specific constraints for getting to the poor, that the poor face uh, many constraints simultaneously. Uh, so uh, this is a lesson that, that people who are in this uh, uh, area of, of social protection and, and, and helping people move out of poverty should, should be thinking about it. But the primarily challenge is that some, many of these programs are in different uh, agencies and are operated almost independently from each other. Uh, so, so the other thing that, is, that we are now facing is that a substantial amount of resources is, is moved into the hands of the LGUs. And we know that LGUs are very fan of, 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 of interventions for the poor. So this, this evaluation should, should uh, educate, help educate uh, LGUs to pick the right interventions uh, as, uh, uh, as their in, uh, financial capacity increase. The evaluation results should, give, should guide them in terms of picking uh, uh, and uh, picking uh, designing projects and, and, and avoiding repeat, the repeat of mistakes on, in, in failed programs. I should stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that that's a good segue to the next uh, uh, question to Albert, and then I'll switch back over to a little bit um, more of the detail. Details on the on the program and which is in the question and answer part, but Albert, at the at the corporate level, ADB has been placing a lot of importance on conducting impact evaluations, especially on rigorous impact evaluation with appropriate quantitative analytical methods supplemented by qualitative analysis. Why are these evaluations so important? And are there any good examples on how they've impacted policy decisions and program design that you think really uh, jump out and, and, uh, and, and show the power of evaluation? And then um, also uh, related to that, are, um, what do you think are effective ways to take forward this evidence and ensure that it doesn't just stay as a report on the shelf, but it actually um, has an impact in, in future implementation? Thank you. Oh, thanks for that. Um, well, it's almost self-evident that doing rigorous impact evaluations are important to even just know what works and what doesn't work. And so that's one reason we're, you know, very supportive of efforts to expand their use, um, both for ADB projects, but also to support uh, governments to evaluate the policies that they're implementing. Um, and uh, it's also uh, important to think about how the evaluations can help us improve policies over time um, as a learning device. And I think um, Emily's presentation really, I think, conveyed that spirit that, you know, we know some things that, about graduation programs that work, but can we improve them? Um, and so let me say a few words about some of the important ways we need to learn. We, can, we should be trying to learn from impact evaluation studies and connected to uh, this particular study on the graduation program in the Philippines. So first is, it's really important just to replicate interventions in a wide range of contexts uh, before you can start convincing policymakers to adopt it, which, you know, answering your last question is really the goal in the end, is to help them scale up really uh, impactful interventions and policies. And so uh, there have been uh, maybe six or seven or eight previous, maybe more than that, previous evaluations of graduation programs in other countries. So it's great to do it in the Philippines as well, uh, just to add to that body of evidence, especially because it's building on previous evidence that this program seems to work, especially for the ultra poor, and the impacts uh, seem to uh, persist over time, which is exactly what you would want. Um, but then the second thing um, is to think more carefully about what are the design features of the program that are most important? And is there any way we can save money and still deliver the benefits to make it more cost-effective? And in this particular study, of course, that was done by really honing in on this group versus individual coaching and livelihood guidance. Uh, and that's extremely helpful to just to add to the evidence. And I think the results, at least in the Philippine context, are quite convincing that the group coaching seems to perform 
as well as the individual coaching. It seems like the jury is a little bit out on the group livelihood versus the individual livelihood. Um, one, um, one question that I thought was interesting uh, about uh, related to the results is that uh, Emily suggested that, you know, the take up rate of the participation was a bit lower in the first treatment, which explains kind of um, the lower impact. And maybe that was because of COVID or implementation issues. But of course, it could also be that people like to meet in groups and with a group livelihood training, uh, uh, group coaching, uh, group more group activity that, you know, they, they can be accountable to each other, they can share information, there are other ways in which that would, could be beneficial in this context. Uh, so it's not clear, of course, uh, why the participation rate was lower, but the answer to that question really will affect uh, how much confidence you have in recommending group versus individual uh, livelihoods. But that's kind of the process of learning, right? Um, now, the other, uh, the other thing that's really important in thinking about what, how we can learn for, from uh, impact evaluations and give good advice to policymakers, and uh, uh, something that policymakers care quite a lot about is, what are the contextual factors that really matter for success? Uh, because there's a huge external validity problem when you do a, an impact evaluation in one village or even one region. If I scale up to other regions, how can I be sure that it'll still work? Um, and it would be interesting to reflect more, for instance, the findings in the Philippines are that the rate of return is over a thousand percent, assuming persistent impacts, which is actually much greater than the previous studies. You know, in other Asian countries, IPA study in the past, you know, so Pakistan, it was like 180 percent return, India, 433 percent return. Um, and is there something about the context in the Philippines that can help explain that? Because by understanding the, how the context matters, we start to understand uh, in what conditions the program will be most uh, beneficial. Um, you know, even the fact that the income effects seem to be elusive to uh, capture in the data, you know, is it that it was effective in some areas and not other areas, some types of projects, not other types of, is, you know, how, to what extent the context matters. I've done some work on uh, microfinance evaluations where we really spent a lot of time thinking about how, you know, the ex ante presence of uh, credit and other availabilities could support businesses, even without program that affects the impact. Uh, also the business opportunities or labor market opportunities. And so there are a lot of even village level factors can, that can really, um, affect how giving someone an asset will matter. And um, the last point I wanted to make, uh, just a, a point about this evaluation and how to think about the criteria that policymakers should use is, I thought it was quite interesting uh, that the subjective well-being measure, which in some ways is what economists would say is closest to utility, right? Uh, which ca captures everything, was, was actually much more significant for the second intervention. And I know it's related to the group interaction that brings benefits. Um, but, uh, you know, in the UK, for instance, they're trying to incorporate more of these types of subjective well-being estimates into policy evaluation. Um, the rate of return is based exclusively on the consumption return, but maybe we should be thinking more broadly about that. And the other thing I would just uh, emphasize is that uh, even these rates of return are based on assumptions about the persistence of the effects. And there's very few impact evaluation studies that just keep going back in the long term. To, so we really learn about how persistent effects are. And, and, you know, Emily's last slide points to it. We should keep following and we should keep understanding how persistent these effects really are, because that has a huge impact on how we assess uh, the return on these investments. Um, one last comment on COVID. I, one concern I had about the very large consumption effects relative to other countries is that I mean, could there could it have been the case that you know COVID hits and households become very cautious because there's so much uncertainty under COVID, they consume less, maybe they save more, but maybe at the time of the follow-up survey, uh, December of last year, COVID has kind of faded. People are getting back to normal, and now they have that extra savings from you know the really crazy times, and so they just start to consume more because they can't. You know, there could be these dynamic uh, factors related to to the <laughs> progression of the COVID pandemic could, that could, could affect these results. So I just raised that as also a question. So thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Albert. Um, uh, there's a, um, to, 
to, to follow up on that, on that last point, there are a few questions uh, maybe directed at Emily for some clarifications on the, on the evaluation. But just before that, if we can pick up the ones from uh, Melba Tutor, um, Lauren, on um, a couple on, on how it's actually done. How are the livelihoods chosen and how are the treatment households grouped into coaching groups? And then underneath, there's also another question, just um, what is the role of technology and, um, and, and does that, is, is it used in the, in the coaching or is this really just for monitoring purposes? For, first to you, Lauren, on that, and then uh, we'll pick up the other ones on the, on the um, analysis of the evaluation data to, to Emily. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, and I think I'll answer that second question first around technology. So primarily for this particular uh, pilot program, it was really used for the actual digital monitoring. Um, there was some use of digital technology in the trainings, um, particular when, particularly when there were interactive trainings that could be used to teach people more around business management skills, financial management skills, et cetera. So there was some use of technology there, but it was mostly for the digital monitoring. Um, and then in terms of the other question for how the livelihoods are set and why we might have seen some of the shifts and flows, and um, I definitely thank the other colleagues who are here on the panel for their remarks as well, specifically as as it relates to the livelihoods and some of the interesting patterns we see in the individual versus group. So for all households, there is a resource and skills assessment that happens at the outset of the program. And that resource and skills assessment accompanies the market assessment. So the market assessment is basically looking at what the opportunities are within the market writ large, looking at where we'll hit points of market saturation, for example. And then that's triangulated with the skills assessment for each household with the resource management assessment of what kind of resources and assets and so forth they have available to them. Um, and then also looking at what the market will bear. All right? And then that is what's used to create um, a list of opportunities. With the DSWD Padayan SLP program, they've actually expanded the list of livelihoods opportunities to give people more of a diverse set um, to actually invest in and have also expanded on some of the livelihoods trainings, not to have necessarily a one-off training on their livelihood, but to actually come back and do additional sessions, which ended up being very necessary during COVID. So for example, there were emergency sessions on risk management. Um, there were emergency sessions to help households actually figure out what to do with their livelihoods when markets completely shut down, um, when they weren't able to engage or interact with others, et cetera. And so it's actually interesting the comment that Albert made around the spending, that was actually probably partially a result from the coaching as well, which yes, definitely the coaching in the groups has a very different impact. You see a lot of peer influence effects, um, but part of it was because the coaches were actually encouraging households to save, to hold on um, to their resources, to not consume as greatly because one, they were unsure of what was going to happen with COVID and when they could re-engage with their livelihoods, quite frankly. Um, and two, because there were also some additional supports coming in during that time with the, the top up of the cash transfers for households. So it sort of offset what they needed to use from, um, from their own income generation for spending. And then exactly like you said, at the end of the year, you have people just relieved and we're at the holiday season and people are happy that they're healthy and well and still here. And you see some increased consumption patterns, um, certainly. Um, but some of that was also part of the, the coaching framing. So I would definitely say that in terms of how the livelihoods are selected and chosen. And the only other thing I would mention is just um, when you're really looking at these livelihoods across different contexts and what households um, are actually brought into working with, it almost in some cases, it, the, the market assessment is very important because that tells you what livelihoods are best for that particular context, but it's more about how the households are taught to engage with those livelihoods that indicates what kinds of income patterns you're going to see later. So all the, are those households ta taught excuse me, to stay in those livelihoods long-term, which was actually something that was a requirement for some of the group livelihoods. You weren't necessarily able to sell your assets and invest in something else if the market shifted. Were those households engaged in a way that taught them to be more dynamic and actually to pay attention to market trends and then follow those trends and so forth. So I think those are actually some factors that are worth paying attention to when we think about the external validity of these kinds of economic inclusion approaches. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, did you wanna say anything finally just about the digital side? Was there oh, I mentioned anything that beyond the, the- Just in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, Emily, thanks. then um, for the questions, there's a few questions here related to the impact uh, evaluation itself. So the first one is, aside from the income data being noisy, are there possible reasons why operating livelihoods may increase consumption, but not income? And, uh, and then a little bit further down um, from uh, Samir, um, I'm curious why the differences are not large. Um, 
between the individual versus uh, group group coaching, one would think individual would be a different. Can you speak also about the impact on business ownership um, as 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 uh, one of the additional uh, impacts. Thank you. Sure, these are great questions. So with respect to thinking about that, um, that rise in consumption, but you know, no detectable change in income, you know, I, I described it as income is hard to measure, which is true. And, you know, as um, Dr. Robeta said, like there are other contexts where we, we don't, we see exactly the same pattern, but that doesn't mean we should just wave our hands and say, okay, I guess it's hard to measure. Um, and so I think there's a few potential explanations. The challenge is we just don't know which it is. One is what Lauren mentioned, um, the idea that uh, households might've built up savings. We do see savings differences, um, much higher savings rates among the households that were, um, particip- that were um, involved in the program. And so you can see income go, you can see consumption rise without income rising if people are drawing down savings, which may have been um, happening because we're coming off of the most intense period of COVID because we were heading into a holiday season. That's a possibility. Another is that um, income can be highly seasonal. And when we were collecting data, we were sensitive to this. So for example, when we were asking about profits from livestock, we used a a wider range of time to reflect the fact that if you were engaged in swine fattening, that's more of a three month cycle. And so you could easily have no income because your, your pig is just growing. Um, so we, we did our best to capture that, but at the same time, if people were pausing their businesses because of the holidays, if there was um, some dimension of they had been running it for part of the year, but now they weren't, or they had taken a pause, we wouldn't be able to capture that because we're just looking at that one point in time. And then the other possibility is that individuals are, are um, kind of like the saving story, they're drawing down essentially the value of their assets if they're shutting down their livelihood. Um, that's the more pessimistic one. Um, and ultimately, you know, we would have to see sort of what happens next. Um, if it's the case that there is no, you know, people, businesses are running at a higher rate, but they're not generating any income, then these consumption effects just couldn't persist. Um, but if it's the case that it's just about timing, then that's something that we should be able to see um, in, in later studies. And then with respect to the, um, you know, why are there, why, why aren't there differences between the individual and the group coaching? And specifically, like when we think about that business, I'm not going to reshare my screen, but the idea is that the individual coaching arm did have a higher rate of high business ownership, a higher rate of business ownership. And so there's, there's two things to think about here. One is we're looking at an average effect, right? And so this is going to reflect people who at the individual level um, with individual coaching did very well, really like really benefited. And then those who benefited slightly less. And similarly within the group setting, the potential for that variance is even higher, right? There are people who who came and were engaged and and Lauren alluded to this, you know, you might have people who were really, you know, really involved and active in that group setting. And as we saw from um, some more qualitative work with some of the attendance records, there were some, some households that just didn't attend as regularly because you don't have the same accountability. And so, we might expect this might be an area for, for future research that those impacts aren't actually the same for everybody. There are lots of reasons and there's there's other evidence about the impacts of these programs being relatively heterogeneous. So one possibility is that it turns out it makes no difference. Another possibility is that it's beneficial for some to be in groups. It's harder for some to be in groups and that it more or less washes out. Um, and I think there's a lot of reason to think we're in that group um, because of some differences we see in terms of people's engagement, in terms of people's participation in the group sessions. Okay, wonderful. Um, just a final question to you, Emily, and, and uh, real fast, we just have a couple of minutes, but um, uh, this evaluation was done after a relatively limited period of implementation time. So um, would further post inline survey be important? And um, you know, when do you think would be a good timing for that? And then also, what would you advise for the new scaled up program, a similar evaluation process? And if so, with what timeframes or any other parameters you think are important? Um, thanks for that. So I think in terms of follow up, um, I mean, you've You've hit me advocating for it quite a bit, a little bit already. Um, I think it would be helpful. I think there are the things we can learn with an additional follow-up that we can't otherwise. Um, I think the timing of that depends on a balance between the longer you wait, the more time you have for effects to sort of grow or, or fall. Um, but the longer you wait, the, hard, the harder it is to find households again. And the more likely it is that you kind of miss action in between. And so, you know, one plan is that there, 
have been studies where people have done a, a two-year follow-up and then a seven or a two and a five. Um, the sort of decision about what exactly that timing looks like, I think is, um, you know, really reflects what we think the dynamics are likely to be in order to catch that. And so I don't have a blanket answer, answer there. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, more than a year later for sure, but like whether that's one or three, I think that's, it's sort of a, a more nuanced conversation. Um, and then in terms of the lessons for scaling up and like, what would that approach look like? I think some things would be similar. I think some would not. Um, so one thing I think that would be similar is that when we think about scaling up, there's a whole host of new questions. Um, you know, when you're looking at a, a relatively small pilot, you're treating a relatively small share of people in terms of a marketplace, obviously in their local community, it's not, but in terms of the bigger, um, say province or region, it's it's not that many people. And when you start thinking about bigger, larger programs, you have to start thinking about how the people who are involved, how that affects those who aren't in the program. And there's been some evidence that there's actually been some positive benefits for those who don't even participate. Um, but that's something to consider and also think about, is that something you want to measure um, to make sure you really understand the full impact of, of the program? There was work in Ethiopia where if you, if you missed that, spillover, you'd actually miss a whole lot of the impact. Um, but then also when you scale up, I think the potential for thinking about these types of program variations is actually becomes more important. And one thing that in a, in a situation with scale, what we did here was we were really thinking about that kind of proof of concept and what's that overall effect. Um, but for a lot of these iterations and these types of implementation changes, you don't need to wait so long in order to see things. For example, individual versus group coaching, we can now say, here's what the overall effect is. But if we're worried about our people being left out, are people participating, are they learning the content? You could actually do that in the middle of implementation to see who is coming, or you could do it right away. You don't need to wait for the whole process to happen. And so one thing that, that I would at least encourage is that as we think about what would an impact evaluation look like for a larger scale program is to think about dimensions that are important in terms of cost, in terms of effectiveness, and also in terms of answering the questions that policymakers really care about, right? Because that's what actually matters is to the extent it's actionable and also is, 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 is motivating, right? That it, it's um, the things that they care about. Um, is thinking about ways to integrate, maybe continue this sort of longer, what's the overall impact? Because I think that is an important message. But when we think about these sorts of program design variations to also consider ways to integrate that in a more short-term way. Okay, excellent. Well, that's a, that's a terrific place to end. We are at the end of our time this morning. Um, I'd like to thank all of the discussions for a very rich and fruitful discussion. And from the Asian Development Bank, we thank uh, the audience also for your active uh, participation. The next Asian Impact webinar will be about mobilizing taxes for development Asia. Uh, just a second. Um, on 6 June 2022 from 10 to 11 a.m. Manila time. Thanks very much for joining us, us this morning and uh, goodbye. Have a good day. Thank you.